All right, so I love the, I, I have to say I like some things about Canvas definitely better than Blackboard. I like this kind of to-do list that's on your front page, you know, when you first click on the course, right, and you have your thing, and mine's kind of squished because it's on my laptop, but, um, you know, for me, it's what I need to grade, and which is good because it kind of um, helps me remember things, right, and, and for you guys too. So um, I see that there's three, three more that I need to grade, um, but if for some reason you haven't done this yet, if you haven't done the lockdown browser, you haven't reviewed test one, you definitely want to do that. If you need help today, um, I don't have office hours today, uh, but I'm free right now after this class. So if you wanted to maybe go right upstairs to the computer lab and learn how to do that because they have the program, I'd be willing to help you with that um, if you have time after this class today. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how to review your, okay, so Lance was asking the question, where do you go to get the program, you mean, for Lockdown Browser to put it on your own personal computer? <laughs> okay. Um, well, once you download it to your computer, you should have the icon that looks like this, right? Uh, if, you, if you didn't put your icon, you can search in your programs, right, for Lockdown Browser. is another thing you could do on your computer. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have it in my syllabus. I have it in Canvas, right? So um, so the last thing before I, I'll show you that, I just want to remind you guys to do the chemicals used to clean assignment that I went over at the beginning of class last time. So that's just a reminder. If you want detailed instructions, watch Wednesday's recording. So to get to the lockdown browser to, to download it, if you want to do it at home, you go to the exams module, right, and reviewing your exams is the link to the lockdown browser. Uh, and I have it embedded in there because I want you to actually read, right, this information. So when you read this information, right, there it is right there. There's the picture. There's the link. And it's free. No, no, because it's not, as in, it's not, I changed the due date to Monday. I don't, I don't usually grade that until after the due date. No problem. Okay. Any other questions, problems, concerns? All right, so we need to get a little further than we did last lecture. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so back to viruses. So last time we talked about that important step of attachment, right? And if you read and remember the details for these steps are in Chapter 8, right? So for entry... So once it attaches, then it's got to actual, actually enter the cell, right? At the very least, what part of the virus must enter the cell? So what is a virus made out of? What parts? What molecules make up a virus? What general molecules? Proteins, right? They make up the coat, right, that we refer to as the capsid. What do they surround? What's inside? The genome. What's the genome made out of? DNA? Is it always DNA? Viruses are all DNA? They could be RNA, right? That genetic information must, at the very least, enter into that cell, right? Because that's what's going to be copied into more DNA or RNA and what's going to be used to make the viral proteins to make the capsid. So at the very least, the genetic information, whether it be DNA or RNA, must enter that cell. Now, cells differ. We talked about this last time. This is why different viruses attack different cells, right? Plant cells are different from animal cells and different from bacterial cells. And there's an additional barrier you have to deal with as it relates to plant cells and bacteria that we don't have in animal cells, right? What's that extra layer? The cell wall, right? So that creates a, an additional problem for viruses, right? Because that's a pretty rigid layer, too, that it's got to get across. And then every cell has a cell membrane, right? At the very least, they've got to get that information across or through the cell membrane. So depending on the virus, 
and what cell it's getting into, they're going to achieve this goal of entry of at least the genetic information in diff different ways. So there's a general scheme to most of the things that we see, though. Right, so as we just said, the problem with, and even fungal cells too, right, is that they've got that cell wall, that extra layer. So for naked or just viruses without an envelope that are just nucleic acid and protein coat, that's what they're showing you here. For animal virus is... They can attach to some receptor, as we said, that has to happen. they got to attach first. That attachment can cause that cell to engulf the virus, the whole viron, right, the nucleic acid and that protein coat, into a vesicle, into a membrane-encased vesicle. This we refer to this process as endocytosis, right? Some of our cells do this on purpose, right, to engulf... Uh, bacteria and destroy them. But all animal cells have this innate ability and this virus triggers it and causes the cell to take it up into that vesicle. And then naturally those vesicles will pump hydrogen ions into that endosome, into that vesicle. And it makes it an acidic environment. It actually changes the pH. Most of the time, that's going to destroy stuff like bacteria. In this case, it causes changes in the structure of the proteins associated with that virus, such that it's able to escape out of this endosome or make a hole in it. So either the whole thing escapes or at least makes a hole and the nucleic acid gets out. And so there's an additional step here too, if the whole viron gets out of that endosome, then it either needs to digest itself, like the, the protein coat needs to come apart, right, or an uh, opening needs to happen in it so that the nucleic acid can get out. For envelope viruses, Basically, they almost have a membrane, right? That, that envelope is a, a bilayer, and it actually comes from the cells that they infect. But it has their proteins inserted into it. It has to, because otherwise, again, they wouldn't be able to attach. So sometimes the attachment, like with HIV, and there's more than just the CD4 receptor. If you read, they go into actually the details for HIV. There's other receptors on the surface of those cells that bind to and facilitate this contact between the virus and our membranes. And it actually causes their envelope to fuse with our membrane. Right? So it becomes part of our membrane. And in that process, right, the nucleocapsid, the protein coat with the nucleic acid, enters into the cell. And then again, of course, the nucleic acid has to come out of that protein coat, out of the capsid. Yeah, the membrane fuses with our membrane. Their envelope fuses with our membrane. So this is where... Sometimes a moving picture is worth a thousand words plus, right? Yeah. So like if we go to our book, I probably should have just put the links in to my presentation, but that's okay. All right, so we go to chapter eight, because remember that's where the details are on viruses and how do they enter our cells? Okay. 
I don't know if I can make this full screen. There. Uh oh, did I mess it up? It's just slow. Oh, okay. It's just really slow, huh? How do viruses enter home? Somebody had the volume turned all the way up. They must have had a... Okay. Well, watch it, because I'm not going to wait for it. <laughs> you need to see that fusion. Watch it. Okay. All right, and then the next way for envelope viruses is very similar to non-envelope viruses. It causes endocytosis, right? So where it actually takes it into a vesicle. But in this case, too, a lot of times that envelope around the virus will fuse with the membrane of the endosome. So you see that right there? See how it's fused together? And that creates the opening so that the nucleic acid can get out although they're not showing it out of the capsid, but uh, that also may need to happen. The problem with plant cells, again, is that cell wall. None of the viruses that infect plants have a mechanism to penetrate that cell wall. They have to rely on outside factors to get, allow them to gain entry. So when insects feed on plants, right, they poke holes in them. And the insects themselves can even transmit the virus from one plant to another, right, because they may pick it up as they're feeding from a cell that has it. And then they go to another plant, and they, you know, almost just like how mosquitoes transmit infections for us, same thing for plants, you know, except it's not mosquitoes that eat them, it's other insects. I can't even think of a specific bug <laughs> aphids or whatever yeah um, and then you know plants can be damaged by you know wind right could blow and bend the plant and create a break in a, in a cell and allow the penetration of a virus in um, heavy rain hail fire um, when we prune and cut plants and, and what we do to plants can create the breaks enough that a virus can get in. But they can't get in on their own. They have to rely on these other factors that create breaks in the cell wall for them to get in. Unlike bacterial phage, which are viruses that infect bacteria, bacteria, as we know, for the most part, there's very few that don't have a cell wall. For the most part, they all have cell walls. So their viruses, uh, again, are going to specifically attach, and you know they they have this really cool complex structure where once they attach, then they initiate a process where they literally inject part of their core through the membrane and through the cell wall, and that leaves an opening so that the nucleic acid and any enzymes can penetrate through that cell wall and gain entry into the cell. That's the only thing that enters, and that's the only thing that really has to enter, right, is the nucleic acid. This whole big protein capsid does not enter into the cell at all. It stays on the outside. And remember way back when we were talking about genetics, this is one of the ways looking at bacterial phages, they were able to prove that DNA is, is, is it, right? It's where the information is. Because that was the only thing that entered into the cells, was the DNA. And yet from that DNA, we can make more DNA, right? And we can make um, proteins. But there's one step in between, right? What do we have to do from DNA to proteins? What are we going to make? Yep. Well, what do we translate? 
what molecule? That's the process of information in our cells. We go from DNA to RNA to proteins. So that's important, right? And this is why I cover genetics before I go over this, because the next thing we're going to talk about is all these crazy replication schemes that different ones have. And so I like to talk about this first. And this is the viral life cycle or replication cycle. For we we usually focus on bacteria viruses because again this is microbiology but this also relates to viruses that infect us as well okay so there are some viruses that get into a cell doesn't matter what cell bacteria cell animal cell whatever they've got to copy their genetic information whatever it is RNA DNA and then they've got to make those proteins and they're going to assemble and they're going to exit the cell that is referred to as the lytic cycle because they literally lyse the cell, bust out of the cell. Do all viruses go into our cells, replicate and bust out? No, some of them actually incorporate into our cells DNA. They take their genetic information and they stick it in our DNA. And this is true too for bacteria, right? Some viruses infect them and instead of copying, instead, they take their DNA and they insert it into the DNA of the chromosome of that bacteria. That process is referred to as lysogeny. Or lysogenic. So phage that do that, that spend part of their life cycle hidden in the chromosome, are referred to as temperate phage as opposed to what do you think we mean when we say a virulent phage? Virulent, right, causes infection, causes problems. Those are the ones that copy and bust out of ourselves. Tempered phage can go back and forth. They can either hide or they can go through the lytic cycle. That transition from lysogeny where they're hiding to when they bust out is called induction. Right. So lytic phase, they replicate, they burst out. This is what we refer to as a virulent phage. Lysogenic is when they incorporate into the genome. When a phage is incorporated into the genome, the name we give to that phage is a prophage, right? So it has the potential to do something, it's just not doing anything right now. It's hiding. The interesting thing about that is as each one of the bacteria cells or one of our cells that have that prophage in them, when we copy our DNA, we copy that DNA too. And so each one of the new cells has that viral information in it. At any point, that viral information could come off the chromosome, can be used to replicate that virus and make more viruses and actually bust out of that cell and go infect other cells. Since this stuff incorporates into our DNA, or into the host cell's DNA, they only do this once. They have a mechanism so that only one virus gets in to one cell. Because think about this, if they're going to then insert themselves into the DNA, if say 10 of them get in, they're all going to be fighting, right, for a spot in the DNA. And they could disrupt the DNA. Do they really want to do that? Do they want to disrupt the DNA so that the cell can't replicate anymore or can't use that information? No, because what's going to happen to that cell? It's going to die. So they're immune to what's referred to as super infection. And so is influenza virus that infects us. When it gets into the cell, 
it shuts down the receptors that the other viruses would, would attach to. So that they're the only ones in there. They're like, this is my house. You can't come in. I claim this one. So they have the benefit of, the, you know, it's all, they have the house all to themselves, right? They have that cell all to themselves. The bad news for us is, say you inhale a thousand viruses, right? How many of your cells are going to get infected? A thousand, because each one of them is going to have their own home, right? They're like, I'm not sharing. This cell's mine, right? You can't have it. I got here first. I'm closing the doors and locking them. So think about that. So then they get inside your cell, right? So you inhale a thousand of them. A thousand of your cells are infected with viruses. What's happening inside that cell? They're copying themselves. Do you think they make just one copy? No, then you're talking about maybe a thousand more made in a single cell. So you have a thousand cells infected, right? In each one of those little houses, right, cells they've infected, they're going to make, say, a thousand more viruses. Then they bust out. So you had a thousand, right? Now you end up with a thousand for each cell. So that's a thousand times a thousand. That's six zeros. Lance is right. That's a million viruses now. And then it becomes a million times a million, right? You now understand why the flu virus really is evil, right? It infects a lot of cells very rapidly. Kills a lot of cells very rapidly. Hmm? The flu virus. Now, I don't know the, how long it takes to replicate. I don't know that, and I don't know exactly how many comes out of a cell. That's just a, you know, ballpark guesstimation to give you guys an idea of how that's not good news for us, that they, <laughs> single virus per single cell, right? It'd be better if a whole bunch of them would get in one house, right? <laughs> Less of our cells would get damaged. Ah, this was the question. What, 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 what are we doing when we get vaccinated? Yeah, but what does that mean? They're, yeah, they're giving you the virus in a different form, right, that isn't going to replicate as quickly or make you as sick, right, or you're not even going to get sick. It's going to give your immune system a, a preview as to what that virus looks like. Right? It's like showing the picture of a, a wanted person, right? It gives you a warning that if you see this person, you're probably not going to want to interact with them, right? You're going to call the police. There's a wanted poster out for somebody who's not someone you want to interact with. You're going to use this for information. You're going to remember it. And that's what your immune system does. And one of the ways that it does that is it produces protective proteins known as antibodies. And these actually can physically bind to the virus. So if they're binding to the virus, can the virus bind to you? No. We blocked it, right? We put our proteins on their receptors. So when the very first thing they need to do, which is attached to us, they can't do it. Our cells or our system gobble them up, chop them up, throw them out with the trash. Yeah. Right, and that's the thing is, is with the flu shot, the reason why it sometimes will or will not work is we're guessing as to what the virus is going to look like this year. Like, so this is like where we don't get a picture of the bad guy. Like, we don't know exact. We didn't get a photograph of him, right? We're relying on somebody else who tells the sketch artist, hey, this is what the guy looks like. Are they going to get it 100% correct? No, hopefully they get close enough. And so hopefully we get close enough in our guesstimation on what the virus is going to look like this year when they make the vaccine. Yeah, but hey, it works sometimes. I've gotten pretty good at it.
We're going to talk about that in immunology. So I don't want to get sidetracked. We've got to get through this on a time frame. <laughs> All right. But let's talk about a different viruses that you guys mentioned last time. So herpes is a big one, right? And chickenpox also falls in the same family of herpes viruses. So the ones that cause cold sores is a herpes virus, typically the type 1. The one that causes genital herpes is typically um, herpes simplex type 2. You can get either one in either place depending on what you do. Okay, do I need to explain that further? Right, so one of your classmates was saying, oh, you know, I'm going to get this one because it prevents that one. No, you can have both, and you can have both in either place depending on what you do. Yeah, got it, right? Okay, okay. So the bad news with this is once you have herpes, once you have this virus, you always have it for life. You cannot get rid of it. We cannot cure you because it's one of those ones that hides in your cells. We never completely eliminate it. We just stop it from going through the lytic cycle of busting out of cells and damaging cells and going into new cells. Instead, the immune system keeps it inside your cell. This is true for chicken pox, right? When you have chicken pox and the first time you get that virus and it's widespread through your whole body, right? And then we get the, we stop the lytic phase. We stop it from busting out of your cells, right? But what it does is it hides, and it hides in a particular group of cells known as your sensory nerves in the ganglion associated with the spinal cord. So wherever it hides, if your immune system is compromised and, it, and the police basically aren't keeping their eye out on this guy, and he escapes again, he starts replicating lytically again. So that's when you get what is the reactivation. We give it a different name because it's a different thing that happens, right? But it's the same virus. Reactivating. What do we call that infection? We call it shingles. And the reason why it's so painful, anyone who's told you that or, or has experienced it, is because of the cells that are being damaged are the ones that sense pain. And that's also why for some people, right, it'll It'll go along a section of their back or even along their face because they're following those nerves, right, across the chest because it's following those nerves. So they have a vaccine for chickenpox, right? There are a lot of people nowadays, 1995, that came out with the chickenpox vaccine. There are some people like my son who hopefully will never get chickenpox. But does he have the virus? Yeah, the vaccine is the virus. We gave it to him. We gave it to him. So is it in somewhere in his sensory cells? Probably. Could he get shingles later on in life? He has the virus, right? It could come out of those sensory cells, replicate, and cause shingles. Yeah, there's a shingle vaccine. But what did I say? It's just a reactivation of the... So guess what that vaccine is? It's a booster of the chickenpox vaccine. It's just a different dosage. It's the same virus. They're giving it to you again. They're telling the immune system, hey, this guy is there. Don't forget about him. They're reminding you. Right? That's all they're doing. And so because the, the problem is, is we age, our immune system wanes, right? And it kind of forgets things, just like everything else. We kind of start forgetting as we age. <laughs> it's memory problems. So we have to boost its memory, right, by giving it another vaccine, saying, hey, don't forget, this guy is on board. But yet nowadays we see people like in their 50s, in their 40s, with shingles, right? Professors here at Delgado, you know, we had chicken pox when we were kids because we didn't have the vaccine. We actually had to suffer through that horrible thing, right? And everybody, when they were kids in my generation, when somebody in the neighborhood got chicken pox, instead of like other infections where you don't go to that person's house, instead everybody went to their house. We called this a chicken pox party. Because you wanted your kids to get chicken pox before they went to school. Because once you went to school, if you got chicken pox, you missed two weeks of school, basically, when you get chicken pox. Because you can't be around other people, right? Because then they would get it. Just kind of silly because of the purpose. Right? But again, it's it was better to get it when you were younger. And we didn't have a vaccine. So we naturally 
purposely exposed our kids to it. All right, so I had it. One of my sisters was apparently a very clean player. It's respiratory transmitted when you have chicken pox. Like, she didn't, like, get all up in the other kid's face, I guess. She never got it till she was in high school, which really sucked. All right, really sucked. Nowadays, you can get vaccinated. The other scary thing about chicken pox is it can cross the placenta, right? So for women who never had it when they were a kid, right, they get pregnant, and then if they're exposed to somebody, right, their baby could die from something as simple as chicken pox. I'm 100% serious. I don't lie to you guys. But... Shingles, on the other hand, not respiratory transmitted. It's just replicating there in those sensory nerve ganglia. So only if you came in contact with the pustules, right, the, the actual wound, would you actually come in contact with the virus. Okay. Unlike chickenpox, not only is the wounds infectious, but your respiratory secretions are infectious as well. We, that one's harder because it, in, so Lance asked, why can't we eradicate that one? Because it's one that incorporates, right? So that's the thing too with, so, so chicken pox, right? Does that make sense to you guys in the relationship between chicken pox and shingles? So the same, similar is true for um, herpes, okay? So commonly associated with the epithelial cells of the mouth region as well as the genitals, right? Two different types, type 1 and type 2 herpes simplex viruses, right? Type 2 tends to be worse, and it tends to be the one that's spread sexually in the genital region. But you can get either one in either place, depending on what you do. So you see somebody with a cold sore, right? That means that that herpes virus is replicating, and it's damaging those epithelial cells. It's going through the lytic cycle. At some point, the immune system will get it under control and shut it down again. But that means it's hiding there in those epithelial cells. Does that make sense? So when is this hard for our immune system to keep this under control? It's hard when we're stressed, right? When we're not eating properly because you've got to feed the immune system, right? It's got to make those proteins. It's got to make those cells that does the job. You need nutrition to do that. You need rest, you need a proper diet, and you don't need those other stressors that are gonna interfere with that. So when do you see cold sores during the semester? Test time, right? Finals, right? Definitely final exam, sometimes midterm exam time, right? Because people are stressed. They're not eating properly, they're not resting they're weakening their immune system. The immune system can't keep it under control. It erupts again. So they have these lovely commercials and these lovely drugs out there, right? And they interfere with the replication cycle of these viruses. Or some other drugs that you'll read about in the chapter, they talk about how they stop the spread of HIV because they stop the attachment or stop the entry into the cell. So we have lots of antiviral type drugs out there, right, that interfere with things like replication or entry or attachment. So you see the commercials like, oh, you know, my partner takes such and such, you know, drug. And, and, and so that's really good for the person who has herpes because then it's not erupting very often and it's not painful, right? We're able to keep it in the hidden phase and not in the lytic cycle. But that person has that infection. If you get the, any of those epithelial cells transferred to you that contain the infection, you could get it. So even when they don't have a sore, right, if their epithelial cells that are infected get on you, you could get the infection. It's more likely when it's going through the lytic cycle, right, because they're busting out of cells, they're more exposed that you would get exposed to that virus. So I always giggle to myself, yep, you haven't gotten it yet. Because pretending, it's not, that, that drug is not curing the partner, right? It's just keeping them from having outbreaks as often. Which means it, they're less likely to spread it, 
right? Because during an outbreak, that's going to be worse. But the, all the time, they're infectious. They have it. Eventually, you may end up with it. It's just a matter of time and what you do and how you do it. You understand? Yeah. So that, that's what I hate, too, sometimes, is people think, oh, well, you know, we that drug is a cure. No, that drug is not a cure. That's a treatment to keep the person from suffering. Make sense? Okay, so this is a drawing from the other book that I think does a really good job of kind of showing the major steps. So if it's in the lytic cycle, right, that information when it's injected incorporates. So we call that a prophage, right? It's it's in its pre-phage, right? It's, it's not doing anything bad. But the bad news is, is every single one of those cells, as it copies its own DNA, also copies the viral DNA. At some point, some stressor, some, and, it, and it's going to vary depending on the virus, something may cause it to be induced, where it's going to come out of incorporation, and now, instead of, being incorporated, it now goes the lytic cycle, where now we're going to copy this information, we're going to make more viruses, we're going to bust out of this cell, and we're going to infect more cells, right? And it's going to keep going like this until there is a time where it goes, okay, I'm going to hide now. And for us, it's mainly our immune system, right? It's going to get them to stop going through the lytic cycle and instead go through the lysogenic cycle. Again, we're copying viruses in our epithelial cells, or in the case of shingles, the of the chickenpox virus in our sensory nerves. It's there. We can't get rid of it. We can't go in and cut this out of our DNA. That would be pretty awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we're not there. So the problem, Lance, is it's within the world, within our population. There's no way to 100% isolate and get it out of people. I mean, we'd have to basically kill everybody right now that has it and start over. That'd probably be like, for chicken pox, like 80% of the world's population has it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So then this gets the really crazy part. So we said viruses are either DNA or RNA. In addition, they're either single-stranded or double-stranded. Not such a big deal as it relates to DNA, right? The problem comes in is when we're talking about RNA. Because in our cells, we're used to going, right? DNA, RNA, protein. So when the viral DNA gets in, he can use all of our stuff, right? He can use our DNA polymerase to make more copies of him, right? And he can use our RNA polymerase to turn his DNA into messenger RNA that's read by our ribosomes and make his proteins. Everything is beautiful, right? No problem. I'm literally going to use everything in that cell to make more of me. Right? That's if you're talking about DNA entering into another cell. They can use all the enzymes that are already there. Not the case for all viruses, right? They're not all DNA. We group viruses based on what their nucleic acid is. So we, there are three different types of DNA groups, and there's four different types of RNA groups. And so they have a classification scheme, right? Seven different groups. By no means do I want you guys memorizing these, right? I don't even have them memorized. The important thing is understanding if you start with, say, double-stranded DNA, what can and can't you do within a, one of our cells, or any cell for that matter? What are these obstacles that you run up against? So let's just look at DNA first. 
So for the first class of its double-stranded DNA, so this is what's normally in our cells, right? So the, all the enzymes are there, right? They can make that DNA into messenger RNA and make the proteins needed for the capsid. And we can use DNA polymerase to make more double-stranded DNA. Bam. Perfect, right? Well, what if your single-stranded DNA? Right? No big deal, right? We can turn that into double-stranded. That's what our enzymes do anyways, right? They copy one strand of DNA to make the other <laughs> strand. So we just turn the single strand into a double strand. And then that double strand can be used to make messenger RNA to make the proteins. Right? And the double strand can be copied. And then we could just get rid of the other strand we don't need. No problem. Then there are some strange viruses. They're double stranded, right? Look at that. It's got two strands. But then it makes messenger RNA, and that's used to make proteins. Okay. That's normal, right? Normal cellular function, except we're making virus stuff. Some of them, though, take one of those messenger RNA, those RNA transcripts, and they use an enzyme that they brought with them, referred to as reverse transcriptase, where we're actually going in the opposite direction that we normally go with transcription, right? Transcription is DNA to RNA, right? But this is an RNA molecule, and that's what they did. They did transcription here. But now they're going to take this single-stranded RNA, and they're going to use an enzyme we call reverse transcriptase because now we're going to go from RNA to double-stranded DNA. Why on earth would you want to do that? Seems kind of counterintuitive. Why would you go from DNA to RNA back to DNA? Why not just, you know, DNA to DNA? How does it do this? We kind of know why some of these RNA guys do this. So this single-stranded RNA, of course, if your RNA, to be able to use the host cell's machinery, you need DNA. So it makes sense that you would take reverse transcriptase and make DNA, since you are RNA. Because you can't use the host cell's enzymes, right, to make DNA, because we don't do that, do we? Right? We go DNA, RNA, protein. So they've got to turn their RNA into DNA. And so they bring their own enzyme, known as reverse transcriptase, and they make it into double-stranded DNA. And then that can be transcribed into messenger RNA. Or, right, that DNA can then be used to make more RNA, replicate its own RNA. Where's DNA found in our cells? In the nucleus. So sometimes when they do this, most of the viruses that do this, that turn RNA into DNA, this DNA doesn't stay in the cytoplasm. It actually goes into the nucleus and incorporates into the host cell's genome. So these are the type of viruses that are RNA that can hide in our DNA. And then all these RNA guys have a problem, right? Because do we copy RNA in our cells? No, we make RNA from DNA, right? We go DNA, RNA, protein. But they are RNA. So depending on what type of RNA, and if you're double-stranded, that's not a problem because one of those strands is the same as messenger RNA. And they can use that to make the proteins. No problem. The problem is, is they've got to be able to copy their own RNA, right, to make more viruses. 
So how are they going to do that if we don't do that? They gotta yet again bring their own enzymes with them or the ability to make that enzyme. So in the case for, for this guy, this first messenger RNA that it produces could be to make that enzyme, that protein, that will now make one of these singles into double strand to be able to replicate the DNA, the RNA, excuse me, for new viruses. So he needs to bring his own DNA dependent DNA polymerase. Otherwise, he can't copy himself because we don't do that, right? We're not ever going to do that. So the other problem with RNA is the direction, right? So there, that code has to be in a particular direction in order for the ribosomes to attach and read it. So that's referred to as plus strand RNA, the one that is the same as messenger RNA can be read by the ribosomes. So if you are plus strand, again, no problem, right? Ribosomes will read that, they'll make the proteins. The problem is, is in copying your single-stranded plus sense RNA, you've got to make um, DNA. Some of them will do that. So again, they're going from, I mean, they're going to make RNA from RNA, right? And in this case, it'll make double-stranded and break it down into single-stranded. If you are the opposite one, you need a special, you need to transcribe this RNA into the correct RNA that can be read by the ribosome because you're the wrong strand. If you're minus strand, it can't directly be used by the ribosome to be read. you got to make the other strand the plus strand. Plus, again, you've got to have your own DNA, excuse me, RNA to RNA enzyme. You've got to replicate your own RNA. So some of them come with their own enzymes or they have to make their own enzymes right away to go from RNA to RNA. Make sense? So think about this. Hmm, we don't want this virus to replicate. What could we do? What do they need to replicate? They need the, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. They came with that enzyme, right? That's not one of our enzymes. Do we need that enzyme? No. If we shut down that enzyme, can they copy themselves? No. So guess what? There are some drugs out there that interfere with RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, right? The enzyme that makes RNA from RNA. Of course, this only works for RNA viruses, right? that have got to copy their own RNA to make more RNA. Digest it over the weekend, right? And we'll talk about these guys coming out, and then I'll have the new PowerPoint. Uh, make sure you read through Chapter 6. There's a lot of stuff in Chapter 6. And we're going to go relatively quick next week. So read ahead, get prepared. Mm -hmm. No, uh, we do not have a vaccine for Ebola. Did you come in late? I thought so. What's your name? Selma. Mm -hmm. Does anybody need help with Respondus Lockdown Browser? Anyone sticking around? Nope. We're good. Just going to go do it? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that she get that cleaning product correctly. Okay. I can take a look at that. Let me end this.